moving on to the Enlightenment. This is the time period where philosophers argue that reason could be applied to social, political, and economic questions as well as science. Basically, rational, critical thinking could be used to understand human society. The advances in scientific thought inspired European governments and groups of individuals to question the reasonableness of accepted practices in fields ranging from agricultural to laws, religions, and social hierarchies. This intellectual movement, which assumed that social behavior and institutions were governed by scientific laws, is called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment thinkers were also influenced by the Reformation and other cultures, including the Jesuits' accounts of China. The new scientific methods provided the Enlightened thinkers with a model for changing European society. These thinkers were not a homogenous group. They drew inspiration from disparate sources and espoused a variety of agendas. Most were optimistic that the application of reason would lead to human progress. The ideas of the Enlightenment aroused opposition from many absolutist rulers and from clergy, but the printing press made possible the survival and decimation of new ideas. Some of the Enlightened thinkers, you have Adam Smith. He wrote The Wealth of Nations that argued for self-regulating markets, a.k.a. capitalism. And he believed in laissez-faire, leave to do, do as it will, free markets, and unregulated economic exchanges. Enlightenment thought had little impact on lower classes. It was most influential on the bourgeoisie, basically the middle upper classes. Paris became the center of the enlightened philosophes movement. Basically, philosophical things are happening in Paris. The, these, these enlightened thinkers met at salons, which were often organized by women of means and education. And although women patronized these enlightened thinkers, few men challenged the traditional limitations that had been placed on women, allowing them to join. That didn't happen. Mary Wollstonecraft challenged ideas about women's roles and rights in the vindication of the rights of women. And she's the first to argue full citizenship for women, including rights to vote. Continuing on with the Enlightenment, we've got a number of new ideas. We have physiotheology, an attempt inspired by science to explain God's providence by reference to his work in nature and not primarily through the biblical word. We have a support of a rational religion free from mysteries, miracles, and superstitions. We have deism, the belief in the existence of a god or supreme being, but a denial of revealed religion, basing one's beliefs on the light of nature and reason. And deists saw no point in any particular religion. They recognized only a distant god uninvolved in the daily life of men. And then you have pantheism, the belief that god and nature are one and the same. Gradually, highly educated Protestants and Catholics thought more about God's work as revealed through science rather than through scripture. European monarchs argued that they had to have absolute power over their subjects in order to enforce enlightened ideas. Yet using enlightenment ideas, they claimed just as much power as divine right kings and as so-called enlightened despots. And as a result, we have a number of very intelligent rulers who use enlightenment not only to help their own people, but to increase their own power. We have Frederick the Great, he defined himself as a servant of the state. We have Catherine the Great of Russia, who actually corresponded with Voltaire. And then we have George I of England. And these are just some great examples of these enlightened rulers that use the ideas to expand, but solidify their hold in the country. Yeah. So, characteristics of the Enlightenment, guys. When we're talking about that, we've got rationalism cosmology, secularism, the scientific method, utilitarianism, tolerance, huh, no opinion is worth burning your neighbor for. Yeah, we could use a little more of that today. Uh, legal reforms and constitutionalism. So why don't you take a minute, pause this, look over these, figure out where they fit in in your life. Where have you seen them? What are the classes have you studied? And we'll come back. We also have John Locke. The individual must become a rational creature. Human beings possess free will. Neither king nor wealth are divinely ordained. There are certain natural rights that are endowed to all human beings. Life, liberty, property. 
He favored a republic as the best form of government, which is probably why the founding fathers got a lot of ideas from John Locke, as well as Voltaire. Unfortunately, as tough and bad tookish as that name sounds, Voltaire, that's not his real name. Every man is guilty of all the good he didn't do. I really like that quote. If God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. It is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. I love all of these John or all of these Voltaire quotes. John Locke has some pretty good ones, but Voltaire's are just fantastic. I may not agree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Freedom of speech. He also had a novel, Candide. And just some centers of the Enlightenment. Take a look. Focus. Academic centers. Important universities. Also of religion. The bourgeoisie. Europe's cities experienced spectacular growth between 1500 and 1700. Again, look at the map, guys. The wealthy urban bourgeoisie thrived on manufacturing, finance, and especially trade, including the profitable trade in grain. Amsterdam is a great example. Their wealth was built on trade and finance and exemplified the power of the 17th century bourgeois enterprise. The bourgeois forged mutually beneficial relationships between the monarchs and businesses and merchants. And these families become incredibly powerful. They built extensive family and eth ethnic networks to facilitate trade between different parts of the world. They partnered between merchants and governments, which led to the development of joint stock companies and stock exchanges. Governments also played a key role in the improvement of Europe's transportation infrastructure. The Anglo-Dutch Wars of the 17th century provide evidence of the growing importance of trade in international affairs. The bourgeois gentry gradually increased their ownership of land. Many entered the ranks of nobility by marrying into noble families or by just purchasing titles of nobility. But what you have to remember is this class of people are not nobles in their own right, but they can become nobles. They're just very, very wealthy. And a great example, before the word bourgeoisie or the bourgeois became even a word, the Medici family. They were very, very wealthy, but they certainly were not nobles. All right, so here we have some pictures of the new social classes. Very nice, very nice. And peasants and laborers. Serfdom declined and disappeared in Western Europe. It gained new prominence in Eastern Europe, especially in Russia. African slaves working in the Americas contributed greatly to Europe's economy. It is possible that the condition of the average person in Western Europe actually declined between 15 and 1700. But New World crops help Western Europe peasants avoid starvation. High consumption of wood for heating, cooking, and construction, shipbuilding, and other industrial uses led to severe deforestation in Europe in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, and these shortages naturally drove the cost of wood up. And as the price of wood rose, Europeans began using coal instead of wood. Some efforts were made to conserve forests and to plant trees, especially to provide wood for naval vessels. The urban poor consisted of a word called the deserving poor, which were permanent residents in cities, and a large number of unworthy poor, migrants, peddlers, beggars, and criminals. So the deserving poor are the ones that will be taken care of. The unworthy poor, not so much. Women in the family. A woman's status and work were closely tied to that of the husband and family. Common people in early Europe married relatively late until young men could make a living on their own, and young women could work enough to earn their dowries. The young people of the bourgeois class also married late, partly because men delayed marriage until after finishing their education. Late marriage enabled young couples to be independent of their parents, and it helped keep the birth rate low. Bourgeois parents put great emphasis on education and promoted the establishment of schools. Most schools, professions, and guild barred women from participation, though. So take a look. We have some new, new lines, if you will. We have lands inherited by Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, a.k.a. Charles I of Spain. Lands gained by him, states that were favorable, and then his many, many, many enemies. 
Obviously, France is going to be quite an enemy, but you also have a very Catholic ruler who's made an enemy with the Ottoman Empire. All right, state development. Between 1516 and 1519, Charles of Burgundy, who was a descendant of the Habsburg family, the Austrian Habsburg family, that is, inherited the thrones of Castile and Aragon with their colonial empires. The Austrian Habsburg possessions and the position of the Holy Roman Empire. Charles was able to forge a coalition to defeat the Ottomans at the gates of Vienna in 1529, but he was never able to unify his many territorial positions. Lutheran German princes rebelled against the French-speaking Catholic Charles. They seized church lands and gave rise to the German Wars of Religions, which ended with the Peace of Augsburg. Basically, these, these princes of these small kingdoms are allowed to pick their own religion. We mentioned that before. Most of them choose the Protestant or Lutheran face, faith. When Charles abdicated the throne in 1556, Spain went to his son Philip, while a weakened Holy Roman Empire went to his brother Ferdinand. Meanwhile, the rulers of Spain, France, and England pursued their own efforts at political unification. And some of these efforts included exploration. Captain James Cook underwent three voyages to the Pacific Ocean. Joseph Banks accompanied Cook on his first voyage, and then adding to the astronomical, botanical, geographic, and cultural information of the English Empire, he began his own voyages. On later voyages, Cook added Hawaii to Europe's geographic knowledge. In the Polynesian voyages, Cook and Banks were aided by a Tahitian high prince named Tupea. And Tupea helped the Englishmen by translating the Polynesian languages and explaining Polynesian culture and their practices. Tupea also aided Banks and Cook with knowledge about navigation. But there were a number of misunderstandings between Europeans and the Polynesians, and a cultural misunderstanding led to the death of Cook in Hawaii. Joseph Banks, however, continued exploring. He used Botany Bay as a place to explore the plant life of Australia. New South Wales became a penal colony, mostly populated with men, and Merino sheep were introduced to the colony in 1805. British settlement had a devastating impact on the Aborigines of Australia, and we will spend more time in later chapters and uh, two units down talking about the British impact in Australia. So here we have lands in the hands of Charles V and the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire. Spain and Philip II. Some argue he is the first absolute monarch Personally, I don't think so, but that's just me. Um, He ruled Spain from 1556 to 1598 during what was called the Golden Age of Spain. During the same time, Elizabeth ruled during the Golden Age of England. He was a very devout Catholic. He married Mary I of England. After she died, he tried to marry Elizabeth so he could maintain his hold on England. She refused. He invades England with the Spanish Armada in 1588. It doesn't go well. So the Habsburg family is incredibly powerful. Philip II is a Habsburg. Notice the possessions under him, as well as Austrian Habsburg possessions. Later, we'll talk about the Habsburg jawline. English Civil War. You have the Royalists, the Cavaliers, people who are backing Charles, Versus the parliamentarians called the roundheads based on the helmet they wore. And this was a very bitter war that would divide England. It's basically the common man versus the wealthy man. James I, the monarchies of England. He is the first Stuart monarch after Elizabeth Tudor dies. And he alienated power. He becomes what you would call an absolute monarch. And under him, the gunpowder plot, if you ever heard, remember, remember, the 5th of November, V for Vendetta, they referenced that a lot if you've seen that movie, Uh, the Guy Fawkes Day, trying to blow up the Parliament building, didn't go so well. The gunpowder plot was an attempt by some provisional Catholics to kill King James I and most of the Protestant aristocracy by blowing up the House of Lords during the state opening of Parliament. Charles I dissolved Parliament. Unfair taxes under him were also pretty pretty frequently happening. Um, because of Charles I, 
and his ultimate grab for power, this conflict led to the English Civil War. And a Puritan Republic was established by Oliver Cromwell, who was so hated that after he died, people dug up his body to cut his head off. Dang. Charles II, who was the son of Charles I, became king in 1660. He was a fair ruler. He worked with Parliament. Nothing teaches you what to do and what not to do like seeing your father executed. And Charles I was actually the first sitting monarch to be executed. After the Stuart line was restored, Parliament enforced its will on monarchy when it drove King James II, Charles' brother, from the throne in the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and forced his successors, William and Mary, to sign a document, the Bill of Rights, to limit the power of the crown. I should also mention that Parliament invited William and Mary to come and rule England. All right, we'll stop there for today. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. And as always, have a great day, guys. Cheers.